Welcome to the Seeing Red Podcast with Andy Turner and Garrett Fools, checking up on Texas policies and politics with some federal issues thrown in, like the assault weapons ban, interest rate hikes, you get it, but it's mostly Texas, since we can't ignore the big stuff either. And now, here are your hosts, Andy Turner and Garrett Fools. everybody welcome back to this week's episode of seeing red we're glad to have you and we so appreciate you joining us i'm andy turner and with garrett Foles, we hope to be covering whatever you're talking about in texas news we have new episodes that drop every wednesday morning with two new topics every week don't forget you can reach out to us with any comments on existing episodes or suggestions for what you'd like to hear about at seeingredpodcast.com or via email at hosts at seeingredpodcast.com. I promise you'll get a personal response and not some automated responder. We love hearing from you all, so keep those notes coming. We've integrated a lot of what you guys have suggested, and we appreciate it. You can follow us on social media, at uh, on Twitter, at the Seeing Red Pod, and on Facebook, at facebook.com slash the Seeing Red Pod. As always, we'd like to... F- Thank our fabulous producer, the Zipmeister, for helping us put the show together and getting it out there for you to enjoy. All that said, on with the show. Uh, this week we have joining us to talk about the Paxton impeachment trial. Um, get his his perspective as a uh, former statewide elected official in Texas. We have former land commissioner Jerry Patterson. He served three terms in the land, in the general land office. From 2003 to 2015, prior to that, he was a state senator from the Houston area, Houston-Galveston area, and he's notable still today for a number of reasons, but the one I think is most relevant to Andy and I's background is that he passed um, the conceal, the original concealed carry bill in Texas, and I and you can give a little bit of history on that if you'd like, Commissioner. But um, that's a, that's one hell of a story because th- they still use the same arguments they used back then for everything. Well, you mentioned the uh, concealed handgun law, and there aren't a, a lot of great stories, but I'm going to tell you one that most people haven't heard. Uh, the first concealed handgun law in 1993 uh, was a House bill, and it had been amended to be a referendum only because Richards had said she would veto it. Categorically, unequivocally, she's going to veto it. So I was a brand new senator, you know, not house broken. We were meeting over there in the, <laughs> in the uh, what that in that office building, the temporary quarters of the legislature. And uh, B- Bullock had a caucus of the Senate, and he wanted to know whether we should even bring it up. And I said, uh, I said, Governor, I, I want to bring it up. I'm going to carry it. And he said, Thank you very much. And anyway, he finally said, No, nope, we're not even going to vote on it. We're not going to waste our time. I was disappointed. And at that time, I was staying at Camp Mabry for $8 a night. Uh, and I had one of those cell phones, you know, a really big brick with the antenna you pull up. Right. It was on my nightstand, and I get, it starts ringing at 3 in the morning. And it's Bullock. And Bullock says, Patterson, we're gonna, I'm going to recognize you on that blankety-blank gun bill, and we're going to stick it up her blankety-blank. So the next day... He recognized me on the gun bill. We passed it and uh, went to Richard. She vetoed it, and that was a big uh, issue at that time, and I think that was why she carried or lost several counties she had carried before. So she lost to George W. Bush, who had said he would sign the bill, and, of course, he later became president, all because of a phone call from Bob Bullock. Wow. 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 It's funny how those things, I mean, I've heard the stories. So I was part of the, um, the, the, the 2021 session with all the gun bills that we got through. And I was legislative director for a a large organization at the time. And so I know who you are because I've heard a lot of these stories, but I'm honored to meet you and thank you so much. But yeah, I, you know, literally got phone calls from, from, from people, there's going to be blood in the streets. And I'm like, well, okay. But they said that back in the (laughs) nineties. Uh, well, we have, um, you, you spent 12 years in the general land office. I know that, uh, if you want do, what explain to the folks at home who may not know what the duties for a land commissioner are like what if i recall correctly y'all are basically the only 
executive agency that makes any money. It is. Uh, it makes, not takes money. Uh, you know, other agencies take money. We make money. And the, the land office is the oldest uh, uh, statewide elected office in Texas. We've had a land commissioner longer than we've had a governor, a lieutenant governor, attorney general. We had a land commissioner since 1836. Uh, the primary function is to make money off of public lands, specifically, more specifically, permanent school fund lands, which are constitutionally dedicated to public education. Uh, that is the primary function, making money. Um, and the other functions are custodian of the Texas coast, the arbiter between uh, property rights and public access, the Veterans Land Board, which came about uh, in 1948, the brainchild of a commissioner who uh, left serving the people of Texas to serve time in Huntsville. His name was Bascom <laughs> uh, He was uh, convicted of land fraud, you know, land commissioner, land fraud, just a natural progression in the Veterans Land Board. Uh, but so since that time, we uh, had the Veterans Land Board, which now does long-term care facilities, which is a bill that I passed in 1997, I believe it was, uh, Veterans Home Bill, uh, uh, cemeteries. Uh, and then the land office has become the repository for every difficult job that state government thinks needs to go somewhere where there's competence. When, when I was commissioner, uh, um, I got a call from Senator Wentworth. They were debating uh, a bill uh, to remove the uh, Alamo from the daughters. He said, some people wanted to go to parks. Some people wanted to go to uh, hysterical commission, but I wanted to go to you. Will you take it? I said, yeah, I'll take it. Um, back in the days of the first hurricane, the big one, I forgot, Ike. Was it Ike? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the governor called me and said, we want you to take over disaster recovery. We did that, and those two things still reside there. But it's, a, it's, the, greatest, it's the greatest office in Texas. I mean, I guess governors, need, you get free housing, but uh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful agency. The history is phenomenal. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about the history and Commissioner uh, Peg Leg Ward, who had his leg blown off in the Battle of Bayard in December of 1835. And then later, in 1842, he had his arm blown off uh, when he was mayor of Austin, firing a celebratory cannon on Independence Day. Um, was it on the same side as his peg leg, or did he get some no, balance I, back? I think it was opposite side. Yeah, I think it was opposite okay. side. So he was still somewhat bilaterally symmetrical. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great office in uh um, I, it was the best 12 years of my life professionally. Just for the listeners at home, you and I have known each other now for about 10 years. Um, my very first paid job on a campaign was uh, in the, the campaign for lieutenant governor in 2014. And it was actually my job to go to all of Commissioner Patterson's events and all of Commissioner Staples' events and all of then-Senator, now-Governor um, Dan Patrick's events. Um to record them because I was working for then Lieutenant Governor uh, David Dewhurst and I was just there to record them to see if they said anything funny. And let me tell you, Commissioner Patterson said a lot of funny stuff that we couldn't use. The stalker, but you were a, you were an equal uh, equal stalker. You stalked all of us except the incumbent. Yeah, that's 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 what it was. So I got to have several conversations with all three of them. Um, I feel like I, so I did the same job against Democrats. Um, up in Iowa after that primary. And then I managed the tracking program for a national organization um, after that. And I got to tell you, I don't know of anybody in my, myself or anybody in any other state who had as good of a relationship as I had with the guys I was tracking in Texas. And part of that was because it was a, a primary. So we all were on the same side afterwards. But it's also because just, you know, a lot of, a lot of interesting characters, a lot of funny characters in that race. It's never dull in an election anyway, right? I, I don't care where you are. It's never dull. And then Texas with all the character and all the characters. So, um, but to kind of, you know, there's mentioned Lieutenant Governor Patrick there. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Our podcast, we've had a segment dedicated in each episode so far to what's happening in Austin right now, which is, the Ken Paxson impeachment trial, you might have an interesting perspective. And I hope, I mean, you'll have an interesting perspective because 
you're a former senator. You are a former uh, statewide elected official. But also, you seem to have one of the, the greatest wealth of knowledge when it comes to Texas history of anyone that I know of. So I was curious what your thoughts were on what's been happening so far, what you've seen come out of the Paxman impeachment, uh, Paxman impeachment, the vote, um, and then kind of we can go from there. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is I'm glad I'm not in the Senate right now, uh, <laughs> not only because of the impeachment trial, which is you know going to be uh, pretty entertaining, not in a good way, uh, pretty taxing and a lot on the line for the senators, uh, depending on how they vote. But also because, you know, they've already had two special sessions. There's another one going to come up in October, I guess, on education. Yep. Uh, now they've got this impeachment trial, and impeachment trials last for weeks. Uh, you know, it's not like something that you have one here. But So I'm glad I'm not in the Senate. And it's, uh, you know, I, I know, I've known Ken Paxton. We were campaigning together. I think when I was first running for land commissioner, no, no, when I was first, yeah, first running for land commissioner unsuccessfully when David uh, won that primary and spent some time with him. He was, I think, first running for the House at that time. And I guess, you know, I, I, he's a very likable guy, and I, and I like him. I can I consider him, you know, we're not close friends, but he, he has a, he doesn't dot the I's and cross the T's very well. And I think that, magnified over years and over having statewide office with a lot of power, um, maybe essentially what got him in the trouble he's in now. I've become, you know, I, I was of the opinion a month ago that the chances of his uh, impeachment and this by the Senate, not his conviction by the Senate were minimal. Uh, I don't think that anymore. Uh, and there's not a day that something, whether it's pertinent, whether it's unlawful or not, uh, comes out that it puts them in a negative light. Uh, yeah. I think there's a kind of a, like you, you alluded to, there's a drip, drip, drip to all of this, but not just during the impeachment trial, but over the past several years of his term in office. It's just, it reminds me a lot of... The, Clint the Clintons, honestly, and not, and that's not to be disparaging towards Pax and to say whatever else, but it reminds me a lot of there's always something kind of kind of where it's in you know you've been the victim of it as much as most is anyone else in the, this there's a media bias where it comes to there's a negative reflection so there's always going to be that we we know that as conservatives there's going to be that bias but there seems to be more it just seems to be more and it's not as if Pax it gets I don't think it generates headlines. I think it's just because it's it's out there. 73 Republicans in the House voted to impeach. About 73% was what it was. 73% of Republicans in the House. And all of those are aware of a media bias. Those, 70, yeah. those, those 60 Republicans are all aware of media bias, and they apparently thought that wasn't a problem. So what I've said several times during the course of this is the first thing that I learned when I got into politics and policy and all of that is the appearance of impropriety in the minds of the voters is the same as the impropriety itself. And that's why, you know, there's that big, bright yellow line, and I'm 10 feet, pat, you know, away from it because, I, no, <laughs> just no. But but I, I, I think you're right. I think a month ago I was, I, I too was going, I don't think this is going to, but, you know, every day there's something else. And, and then today, uh, Garrett and I were talking earlier, there was an article, I can't remember where I read it, that um, three past presidents of the Texas State Bar and and 11, uh, 11 other people, yeah, are coming after him for his law license. And, you know, you, you may be able to fool some of the people some of the time, but you ain't going to fool all of the people all the time. <laughs> It's like, the, what was that little Abner character, the little scruffy guy that had the black cloud that followed him around? Oh, I, mean, I know who you mean. Uh, yes. Joe, Joe, this full, Joe, yeah, it was, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> like what's, uh, uh, that's, I'm, I'm not saying that he didn't, he didn't generate that black cloud, but nonetheless, there's a black cloud that follows him around or, you know, all the time. And I don't know what he's thinking. Now, here's an interesting thought. You know, this uh, rumor that popped up Friday about he was going to resign, 
yeah. and quickly dismissed by, uh, by Paxton. My question is, uh, does he have to get the permission of those who have been funding him through all of this? And how hard would it be to say, okay, I thank you all very much for the contributions to various, you know, to the loans, the cash contributions to currently current officers or the money that you helped me get elected or helped me fight in court so far, but I'm, I'm bailing. Uh, that, that would be an interesting conversation uh, if he were to call up, uh, you know, you know, he, he has, he owes a lot. Uh, and, yeah. you know, like if you owe the bank a million dollars, they own you. If you owe the bank $10 million, you own them. Those right. may not be the right numbers. It might be a billion, whatever, but the, yeah. <laughs> the more the you owe the bank, works. the more you have control. Uh, yeah. But I don't know if that's the case here. I mean, I'm just wondering what um, those um, – who've been supporting him have to say about a possibility of, uh, of resigning. I, you know, the, the rumors of his resigning were interesting because when I first saw him before Braddock, before Scott Braddock with a uh, QR r- did the initial tweet that kind of got instigated Paxson's response. I had seen some rumors circulating among some folks, but they weren't necessarily folks I would call in to know, but I'm just like, it doesn't make much sense to do the, to do, to resign at this point. If he's not going to testify, because it doesn't really change his legal his legal strategy. Because basically, the only reason you would resign here is if there was a reason with your legal strategy. And his attorney on the legal stri- on for his securities case has already said that he'd almost certainly do a plea deal if he gets thrown out or whatnot. So if you get convicted or if you resign, it's just because you want to do a plea deal. But that kind of goes against the whole f- argument that he's been doing in public for the past three months. So it's like if he does it, it's just... Doesn't make it doesn't make sense with what they've done so far. And Garrett, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the rules say he has to show up or his attorney has to show up. But there's nothing that compels him to testify. No, there is that. that there there is something that compels him to testify because there's nothing that well, but there's nothing that compels him to actually have to say anything. So what the in the motions, there's been arguments back and forth where he can be called to testify, and then he, and then and then when he's on the stand, he can invoke the Fifth Amendment because it's not a criminal trial, and it's because this would be like the same case in the civil trial. Usually, civil trials get delayed until after a criminal, which is also why they put in, held into abeyance Articles 11 through 14 because those are directly relating to his civil trial, his criminal trial. That's one of the reasons why they held those in abeyance because until after that, and they and they don't want him to do that because I mean he in that yeah and he the defense strategy doesn't want him to do that for that reason. So I'm curious, Mr. Commissioner, what do you think is is going to happen? What, I mean, we are you know days from it starting as we tape this, and it'll be after it starts when when we air this. But I am wildly curious what you think is going on or what you think will happen. Yeah. I didn't think there'd be enough Republican votes, but they only need eight. They need eight, they need eight or nine or whatever it is. I didn't, you know, uh, and there are how many Republican senators, uh, uh, well, I, I, math is failing me now, but there's a lot of Republican senators. And I've talked to a couple people that are in the know. Uh, and they think that there's, they're there. You know, I I was looking at it like because you there's been there's all been all sorts of rumors about stuff when it comes to Campbell and it comes to Hughes because they're you know adjacently implicated in some of the some of these stuff. Um, so there's there's no telling where, where they're gonna fall. Um, and then you also have but then you also have the Paxton aligned candidate for Dallas County GOP chair who went on the Steve Bannon show. And basically listed off six senators, where four of them were Jordan Berry's clients. Jordan Berry famously, well, to people in Austin, was Ken Paxton's consultant for a number of years. And as soon as the whistleblowers came out, he he fired fired Paxton as a client. Yeah, uh, I just think the votes are there. I didn't think that before. Um, Why do you think that the votes are there? What what what's 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 informing your gut? The uh, constant, uh, the little guy with the black cra- cl- uh, cloud keeps following him around. From Little Abner. Yeah, yeah. So 
In other words, I think it's for those who were saying, yeah, I need to vote against it. Uh, I think they're now saying, eh, I'm not so sure. Uh, no. and I, just because of the drumbeat of, of more stuff. And some of the stuff is repetitive. You know, some of the stuff is already known. I mean, we haven't talked about the Mount Block pin. Um, the Mount Block pin. Mont Blanc, the fancy fountain pens. That oh, Mala- Mount, Mont Blanc. Okay, and okay. So tell that story because I vaguely remember Paxton when going through security at some place is alleged to have when you put your stuff in the tray, he's alleged to have taken somebody's Mount Blanc Mount, Mount Blanc pen. I don't know if that that could be bullshit, but uh, so but that doesn't make any difference. It, you know. If, it, if it's the constant rain of bad news, uh, those that are fence sitters are leaning no or less leaning no, in my opinion. I mean, the bottom line, it, 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 if I were in his shoes, would I resign? Yeah. Of course, I hope I'd never be in his shoes. Because there's a point where you, even if you're right, and let's for the sake of discussion assume that this is all BS and he shouldn't, he doesn't, there's no grounds for impeachment. But even if you're right, there comes a time when it's time to move on because you can't get out of the hole and your continued presence isn't helping. Even if you're right, you know, I understand fight, fight, fight. But, you know, uh, you, you have to think about other things like the uh, general favorability or unfavorability of the Republican Party in Texas, which yeah. is rising in the unfavorable category among certain groups that were generally Republican voters. Um, so, you know, that's that's the honorable thing to do. It may be really damn hard to do to say I'm going to I'm going to quit. But that's another consideration. I would I would ask, you know, Patrick, not Patrick, Paxton has aligned himself with, you know, this this the Finn Liberty Empower scorecard n- nexus of organizations for effectively as long as they've been around uh, or that they've both been involved in politics, but more, more pre- predominantly, especially as he's been a statewide official. Um, so he's kind of, but a lot of those candidates, a lot of those office holders that end up getting voted that way don't end up having any success in Austin because they don't do anything necessary to get their bills done. They just kind of talk and get media attention and then, Right. But Pat, but, but Paxton, Paxton came in in 2003 and kind of jumped more jumped in with them. And, you know, he did get some stuff done. He did get some, like he worked, especially on pro-life laws in the, when he was in the state house um, until he ran for speaker. And then that kind of nuked it so that he had to move chambers and then accelerate his career that way. Um, But he's been an actual Austin operator. Most people, who have met him like you and like, you know, other one else seems to have had pleasant interactions with him. Unlike some of the more bombastic, unpleasant folks that come from that, that orbit. Um, so it's not as much of a personal disdain for Pat Paxton, um, as there are, you know, there's not a personal, people aren't taking it personally. And what I've heard a lot of, and you may have heard the same is people really like Angela. People really, really like Senator Angela Paxton, and they're worried about, especially the senators are worried about how voting for Paxton is, uh, for Ken Paxton is going to impact that relationship. Or people are, aren't wanting to say anything publicly because they're, they're afraid of how that relationship might be influenced. So I'm just, it's a mess. And, but any, that's why the framers in the U.S. Constitution did this because anything with a politician is going to be a mess. You're never going to find an unbiased jury when it comes to a politician. And then you have the state Senate. You, you, then you have to find the be- the best option of a lot of bad options and the house being the grand jury and then the prosecutors and then the Senate being the jurors is this best system that we could, that's been devised for this type of issue. In my view. Sure. Glad I'm not in the Senate now. <laughs> what do you think what do you think is likely to happen as a result of uh I mean it's a really complicated issue right because she she could be really unhappy with her husband and then again she could rise in defense of him and I'm sure that wh- however she feels is known to her colleagues but 
you know, having worked as chief of staff for a state senator and chief of staff for a, 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 a state rep in another state, I, I know there's it's it's its own little culture, right? It's its own little community, and if you have not worked in that office, you don't know. So, so enlighten our listeners as to maybe what that community feels like or what you might expect. You're, you're correct about it's a it's a, a, lot of a, a little microcosm of relationships that is unlike anything else. I mean, the only thing I compare it to it is uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I, I was in uh, several fighter squadrons. I flew Phantoms in the Marine Corps, and that group, uh, they they were brothers. You know, I'm a I'm an only child, but I have brothers, and they're all Marines that Maybe. I serve, um, and that I'm you know some of whom. Uh, some of whom did not make it out of that um, uh, occupation. Uh, but it, it, that was the closest I've ever been to anybody. And you have that in the Senate, but you're not close with everyone. I mean, in, in a fighter squad in ready room, you're, you're, all, you're all close. There's a couple of outliers, a couple of guys you say, eh, I don't want to fly a wing on that, that guy. He'll, he'll, he'll run into me. Uh, or, but there's still division and there are people who uh, aren't as close to fellow senators as you would think they would be having served for, you know, a decade in the Senate. Uh, there are people you don't like. There are people you don't trust. Um, and I couldn't say that about anybody that was in the, uh, any of the fellow air crew in the fighter squadron in the Marine Corps. Uh, there are people that were better than others in the Marine Corps. There are people that were more proficient and less dangerous, maybe. Um, but they were all all brethren. They were all comrades. They were all brothers. But not the case in the Senate. Uh, they're not as tight. There's not 31 people that are kumbaya uh, compadres. If you were in the Senate today, would you um, give any credence to these defense uh, arguments of the forgiveness doctrine or um, – Basically, the, for, the forgiveness doctrine, which basically says that whenever Paxson was alleged to have done these actions, it was before his most recent election, um, re-election. No, I would not. And it's it's because, um, as we were discussing earlier, uh, if somebody were to ask me, when were you elected, land commissioner? I'd say 2002. I wouldn't say the last time I was elected in 2010. It's a common usage of when were you elected? The response is when you were first elected. Uh, it, so it's it's although it's not the clear meaning of the statute because the statute is not clear. It doesn't define. It, it doesn't it doesn't define. I've got it. You know, before the officer's election to office, it doesn't say first election to office. It doesn't say last election to office. So it's not clear. But the common usage of, of when people ask you when were you elected, it, it is clear. Another issue is about the uh, uh, unsworn witnesses right. in the uh, House uh, hearing. For the sake of discussion, let's assume that's a valid objection and holds some weight and is a bar to further prosecution. It can be easily remedied and will be remedied when they appear before the Senate and are sworn in. So that might be good, but it's no longer good when they're sworn in. What um, so far have you seen any any valid defenses that you see for? I mean, I mean, I don't. You're not an attorney, I don't believe. This is, but. That's a, this is an impeachment trial, not a criminal trial. So right. have I, yeah. So have I seen any valid def- defenses that would prevail in an in a impeachment trial, criminal trial? Different matter. I haven't. We only have two other impeachments to compare to. Carrillo in 76 or 75, I'm not sure when that was, it's, he raised, I think he raised the uh, um, before office issue. Did he raise the sworn testimony issue? I don't think he did. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, Ferguson, I did not know till today when I was reading up, he raised the before uh, office, offenses occurring before office issue. I don't know what the transcript said. I don't even know if that statute existed in 1917. So he may have raised it just as a, you know, an attempt to say, you know, this, I, I've done a good job as governor and what I did before 
you shouldn't hold me accountable for. But Ferguson raised it as well. Obviously, it didn't prevail. But I don't know if there was a statute about it in 1917. Yeah, and I think what's I think it's what's interesting is that because it's a political trial, precedent doesn't hold the same value that it does in a in a judicial trial. I mean, they'll look to it and they'll use it for political purposes, but it's a political trial. the The house could it literally indict indict you for chewing gum the wrong way, and the Senate could convict you for that if they choose to. There's another process that is equivalent to this, and that each chamber is the final determination of, 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 of uh, admitting a new member to the chamber after an election. In other words, we've had um, we had an election challenge. Uh, oh, I know what it was. It was when Robert Talton got elected to the House. Um mm-hmm. And, and there, in, in the general election, and that was a district that at that time was, you know, probably leaned Democrat, as did that was this was Pasadena, Democrat, mm-hmm. leaning Democrat, no longer Democrat. But Talton, um, on the on the morning after the election, uh, he lost, and they had a lot of. There was a guy. He's on the Supreme Court now. He was running for district judge in Harris County. And he's a member of this Texas Supreme Court now. I can't think of his name. He was running a write-in campaign for judge. So they had so all those write-in that voted for this guy for judge also voted for Robert Talton. So you know, about three days later, Talton won. And so his Democrat opponent, can't remember his name, contested the election. And that election contest went before the House, and the House could have overturned the election. So. You know, the, the ultimate determination of whether Robert Talton served in the House was not the voters. It was in that election challenge. It was the House. Similar, wow. the ultimate determination of whether Paxton was impeached or not uh, is the Senate. Or, or not impeached, but convicted or not is the Senate, notwithstanding whether, you know, something happened before or after the election. So it's not always the voters have spoken. So, so I, I th- that's a great point because it, it highlights that it's really at the Senate's discretion. There's a there's a there's a there's a rule that they uh, they affirmed in the Senate rules that they, they'll be holding him to a uh, uh, of a standard of um, beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard versus you know preponderance in the civil preponderance of the evidence in the civil trial, but. That's at the discretion of the senators because this isn't your typical jury. You know, you're not just on on your oath or whatever else. You're also subject to the voters making make, making the right choice either way. Like I don't know, I don't know if a Democrat, and that's I don't know if a Democrat except for maybe Senator Whitmer Whitmire from the Houston area who's running for Houston mayor and is going to be relying on. Republican votes in that race. I don't know of a single Democrat who has any reason to possibly vote against the impeachment of Ken Paxton, regardless of what the evidence was. Um, so Whitmire is the only Democrat who may who may waffle, and I don't really see it happening. But he's the only one where it's even interesting to talk about because of the implications of the Houston mayor's. I hadn't even thought of that. I hadn't even thought of that. Huh. Yeah, but I, I don't think that. Uh, Okay, he votes not to impeach. Okay, he's running for mayor. Well, that depends on how much press coverage the Houston voters get, those Democrats, that, yeah. that about Ken Paxton, how much they're aware of it, you know. Yeah, or how much Sheila Jackson Lee can make him make them aware of it between now and whenever the trial ends, so September, let's say the end of September, the elections um, five weeks later. Well, she's not going to want to make them aware of how, of, of how bad a guy Paxton is. No, not a Paxton of, of if, if, if Whitmire votes against impeachment, cause he's trying to lock up Republican votes. Cause it's not, a, you know, cause it's a jungle. It's a nonpartisan. So he, he's the only Democrat I can, I can conceivably see. And any like has a less than as a greater than zero chance. I don't think it's very much le- greater than zero, but it's the only person who I see who has a greater than zero chance of doing of not voting for conviction. But all like you said before, except for Bob Paul, I don't see any Republican that has a zero percent chance of voting for conviction. 
So basically, it's going to come down to how do those twenty, how those eighteen senators, Republican senators, vote. Yeah. So it takes twenty one, even with Paxton out, it still takes twenty one. Yeah, she counts towards the nu- she counts toward the t- whole number. So, but she can't place a vote. So on the f- on the vote to convict, it benefits Paxton. But she also counts towards the whole number when it comes to motions to dismiss. So it means that the so otherwise so if there's fifteen to vote to dismiss, and she would typically be the sixteenth, it would be fifteen fifteen. Patrick's acting as the judge, so he's not voting, so it would fail. So it, there's the benefits to the, the to to the the managers in that, but by, by her being counted because it only requires four Republicans to even say right off the bat. Oh, we want to see these charges, or however many three, and but it requires it benefits Paxson because it requires more to get to that magic number. So, a motion to dismiss is not going anywhere. Yeah, no, that one seems to be. Dan Patrick even seemed to. Um, he's been pretty even-handed or pretty neutral on any comments about it, but even he seemed to indicate and nod his head towards the idea that those motions were weren't going to go anywhere because it only took three Republicans to say, no, we want to see it. And do you think there's whipping going on behind the scenes? Or do you think they're actually genuinely trying to be uh, individual in their decisions? Because a lot of the voting procedures are about keeping the vote secret from them, but not from the public ultimately when it comes to these different votes. What do you, what do you mean keeping this secret from them? So the votes were basically, basically the way the votes happen is they vote on a piece of paper. They submit it to the clerk. The clerk then reads off the name and the vote and they affirm that that's their vote or whatever. And then, so then until the final vote's done, they don't know. So you can't have like, oh, I just saw that Senator Campbell voted yes or no. Now I'm going to vote how Senator Campbell voted. There's no way to. So until the vote's final, it's secret. But like, you're not until final, but you know what I mean? Like until the vote's completed, it's secret to even to the senators. That way they can't see how other senators are voting. Yeah. Okay. Well, I suspect they're talking to each other. Uh, like I'm sure they are uh, about what they're going to do. Uh, but <laughs> that's an opportunity for treachery. If you uh, somebody says oh, I'm voting no, and they vote yes, and you voted your vote based upon their vote, and if that's I would you know. And, and and truly though, even if a senator is telling another senator I'm going to vote no or I'm going to vote yes. You, you really, and, and maybe they mean it, but when that vote comes, it's it's a different terrain and situation than it was when they were talking to that senator prior to the vote, or maybe even prior to the to the uh, trial. Uh, so, and we've seen that on any bill, like they walk into the floor, and you know these two senators are walking together, and then they, you know, something happens, and then you know. The vote changes. That's one of the things a Senate, a good senator is good at is tagging up. If you tell somebody you're voting one way uh, and you find out later you can't, you need to tag up. Yeah. Um, I think I was pretty good at that. Um, but that's mostly applicable to uh, people, advocates for one side or another. But it's also applicable to senators. But it's... Yeah. I, can, I go back to the suspension rules in the Senate when I was there required 21 votes. Uh, and that was a real hard count to be confident of. The suspension being rule being the rule that would spin the rules to move something on the calendar so that you could actually get it to bring it to the floor. I mean, that was a big issue in your, in your, in the Lieutenant governor's race. Cause that was something that Dan Patrick basically, and he's always just as, as Lieutenant governor, has figured out ways to adjust it to there's this many Republicans in the chamber. So do you think that was, in hindsight, do you think that was a wise move on his to lower that threshold to, I think it's 17 now or 18? The Congress, the Congress is, is uh, 60%. Yeah. I would have lowered it to 60%. In fact, I think I said that during the election because truly there's a whole lot of stuff. You know, we only meet, the legislature only meets every two years. There's 5,000, 6,000 bills, some bills that everybody was, no, nobody had any problems with don't pass. And so you got to bring them up again two years later. Just tremendously bogs down the process. If a bill is controversial, uh, it'll be controversial. And, but, but those are the ones that 
you know, you have to pay attention to. But so many bills that were not controversial, everybody kind of thought that was fine, didn't pass, uh, you know, because you can get two thirds but just on a short notice. So it would move the process along. It would eliminate all the stuff on the calendar for two or three or four sessions. What have you been up to since, I mean, I know you ran in 20, 2018. So I actually, that's perspective because you also ran against George P. Bush. You have that in common with um, Ken Paxton. But, I mean, do you think, what have you been up to since, I guess, 2018 with your public life and, I guess, whatever, what have you, what have you been I've been involved in a couple of documentary movies. Uh, one of them, a pretty short one, about 30 minutes, that, Shows aboard the USS Lexington about the history of the Texas Navy. And the other documentary mm-hmm. is uh, an hour uh, documentary about a massacre that occurred on the Texas border in 1918 called uh, Port of Veneer, P-O-R-V-E-N-I-R, comma, Texas. It's on Amazon.com. It'll cost you four ninety five, maybe less now. Well, I'm going to go watch it. <laughs> it's a little known tragic uh event in Texas history where Texas Rangers and local ranchers massacred 15 Tejano Mexicano uh, residents of Texas and a little village on the Rio Grande, all because of a raid that happened on an Anglo ranch about a month before that killed several people, a raid by the Eastas in all probability. And this was in retaliation of that raid. The problem is the people they killed had nothing to do with the raid. Right. Uh, it's a tragic part of history. It and is. So, Gosh. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the president of the HOA. What was I thinking? And, you know, and I've got a lot of little projects. I've been working on cars and, uh, you know, and uh, got grandkids that live in Corpus. And uh, uh, I spend too much time on Facebook. Uh <laughs> I'm involved in the history fight, uh, the current history fight, the, the litigation that was just resolved yesterday between the Texas State Historical Association president and the executive director, J.P. Bryan. I was involved in that, uh, involved in a lot of history stuff. Uh, so you said the 1836 project? Yeah, that was interesting, you know, and, and, and it's amazing the reaction to that among the whining left. Without even <laughs> the damn thing, they said all these things. It was just like the 1776 project, and you know, and they were too much emphasis on the Alamo and Stephen F. and Davy and Jim and uh, uh, and uh, Travis. Uh, you know, and when you do, the, I did a word count. One of the least mentioned topics in there was the Texas uh, was was the revolution and the Alamo. But anyway, it's been it's been. <laughs> been fun because they are so predictable and um, you know the, the whiny uh, politically correct uh, 1836 was all about slavery uh, um, movement uh, and we're having pretty good success well I saw something in the Chronicle on Sunday um, from a columnist I'm sure you have um, th- thoughts on Chris Tomlinson that the headline is "New Travis Statue Celebrates Enslaver and False Alamo Myths Hurts Texas Brand," and he basically goes on to argue that uh, I guess it's Crockett, no, it's Travis, um, that Travis was you know prolific in his sexual escapades, likely assaulted women and you know owned slaves and whatnot. Um, Some of what he says is true, but it's uh, substantially uh, inflated. Uh, but nonetheless, it, this, that's the whole thing. We, we we had failed men. We had Crockett who failed an election. We had we had Travis who was a land swindler and a slave trader in Louisiana. Uh, or, or not, no, that was Bowie. Bowie was a land swindler and slave trader. We had, we had Travis who ran away from his family. They came to Texas. And at that point in time, if anybody uh, deserves redemption, they do. So it, it, that's part of the story. Failed men who rose to the occasion. But let me tell you something about Mr. Tomlinson. He wrote a book called um, Forget the Alamo. And I'm going to mm-hmm. give you two examples. And it's, I have a website, uh, 1836truth, 1836truth.com. I'm looking it up now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, there's, in, that, in their book, 
they're talking about racism in 1836 and how Lorenzo de Zavala was the subject of abject racism. I'm quoting their book. Their source for that quote was uh, Southwestern Historical Quarterly, a particular page. You go to that page of the Southwestern Historical Quarterly, and here's what it says. It says, the De Zavala was held in high esteem. So, high esteem is what the printed word says that they cited. They turned that into abject racism. I'm not making this up. They accused the uh, uh, Texans of raping uh, camp followers at the Battle of San Jacinto. And they cited another specific page in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly. You go to that page, the word rape is not on there. And in fact, a Texian saved a group of camp Mexicans, camp followers, from being bayoneted. Because in that melee, after the battle was over... They were killing all the Mexicans. They were, I mean, it was not a, it was not an honorable time in Texas history. We're killing, shooting the prisoners, everything. And they were going, they were bayoneting them. And they were about to bayonet this uh, Mexican uh, lady, camp follower. And the other Texians intervened and told the guy with the bayonet, if you do that, I will kill you. That, that, so that book, the book is replete with stuff like that. Well, and it's you said it's quarter it's a quarterly magazine, right? No, it's the Texas State Historical Association has published the Southwestern Historical Quarterly for about a hundred years. Oh, it, it, it's a primary source then. It's an actual legit legitimate source. Yeah, Southwestern Historical Quarterly, well known among historians, well respected. Uh, uh, it's you know it's full of minutia, but so they quoted two sources, two credible sources, but they made it up. And that's not all. I can go on. And he's in his in his column from uh, his recent column, he does cite that he that Travis was an illegal immigrant that uh, violated the law of April 6, 1830. Now, this is a point I wanted to raise. Mexico didn't get its independence until 1821. I think the the first settlers came in in 1826. Like the the first the the 300 came in 1826, 1827. But the the whole issue of the Texas independence, unlike arguments when it comes to the Civil War, was that Mexico was very much not real. I mean, it was very much a nascent and very much an infant country. It was still figuring out its own identity and its own borders. That's point number one. It had only recently gotten independence. Number two. There was a constitution, and that Santa Ana was consolidating all the power in Mexico. In Mexico City, he abrogated the constitution of 1824. He fired all the elected governors, disbanded all the elected state legislatures, and took over the government. He centralized and eliminated the federal government. Because of that, right. Texas rebelled, and they're not the only ones. There was like four, there were like several rebellions that happened in the outskirts. Seven countries in rebellion at the same time as Texas during that period, 1836 to 1846. So there were seven uh, states at least in rebellion. Only one was a slave state, that was Texas. So when they argued that 1836 was about slavery, how do you justify the six or seven other Mexican states in rebellion at the same time? You know, they just, California. They, they don't mention that at all. They don't. They don't. They don't mention it. And it also, it's it's frustrating because they use the same playbook that's a little, that's far more grounded in history when it comes to the American Civil War to try and make it this, play the same thing in Texas when the facts don't even come close to bearing out the same. It's part of the pop culture. When we had when we had the uh, uh, BLM uh, you know, protest in San Antonio back after the, the gentleman got killed up in up north. Uh, when we, they were marching in San Antonio, and the San Antonio reporter wrote, the San Antonio newspaper reporter wrote that they are going to the Alamo to protest at the Confederate monument at the Alamo. All right. Well, we've definitely taken up a lot of your time. We definitely appreciate it. Um, Commissioner, are there any final thoughts or any other plugs you'd like to do? Yeah, I'm glad I'm not a senator this year. <laughs> Are you so aside from the homeowners association? Is there any more public service uh, in your future? Uh, no. <laughs> well, I'll be anxious to hear from you later on about what you think about all of the, all of the, the what we're going to see 
you know, unfold. I wish I had time to watch the whole thing. That's right. I'll watch it. You listen to our podcast and you'll, you can get caught up. And then you can drive up the road and we'll 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 have some brown Texas water and some good smoke protein. Okay. And when you put it like that, it sounds healthy. I'm saying. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you for joining us, Commissioner. Uh, we we appreciate you taking the time to, you know, educate us on the both everything to do with Texas, but also uh, with Texas history with your experience. And we 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 hope for you at home. We're sure you got as much out of it as we did. We definitely we, we think. All right, man. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thank you so much. It was nice okay. to meet you. And that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in and for all of your support. We really can't do this without you. Let us know what you thought of this week's show. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Tell us why. We love our fans, and we do answer all of our email personally. We've already incorporated some fantastic ideas for topics that came from other listeners and subscribers. So keep those comments coming. We need to hear from you to know what you want to hear about. You can email us your comments or opinions at hosts at seeingredpodcast.com or just go to our webpage, seeingredpodcast.com. There's a form right there, and it'll act like an email, and we will respond. We always answer them personally, so we look forward to hearing from, from you as to what you like and what you don't like. Also, you can follow us on social media. On Twitter, we're at the Seeing Red Pod, and on Facebook, you can find us at facebook.com slash the Seeing Red Pod. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week. You've been listening to the Seeing Red Podcast. It's always Texas politics and beyond. We present the facts and opinions. The Seeing Red Podcast with your host, Andy Turner and Garrett Fools. Thank you and tune in next week. And please do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode.